This is Dr. James Smith, Director of Male Reproductive Health at UCSF, um, talking to you today about fertility preservation for children, adolescents, transgender youth, and young adults in a micro video format. So there are many, many men and boys at risk for infertility in the United States, and more than 850,000 males are diagnosed with cancer in the United States. And over the last several decades, the survival rate for many types of cancers has improved dramatically. And now the overall for survival rate for many, many malignancies, particularly pediatric malignancies, approaches 80% and, and many times exceeds 80%. There are about 7,000 boys annually who are diagnosed with cancer, about uh, 50 who undergo bone marrow transplant at, a, at an institution like UCSF. For most of these patients, reproduction is one of their top concerns after treatment. And for adults and for adolescents who've gone through puberty, sperm cryopreservation is the standard of care and is, is for many, many patients readily available. This young patient, a 19-year-old with testicular cancer who desires fertility after undergoing testicular cancer treatment three years prior to visit with you. He'd undergone right orchiectomy at, at this point in time, and he did not bank sperm. He underwent chemotherapy with BEP, and he presents to you now with a 19-year-old fiancé, and they'd like to start a family. His medical history is significant for the chemotherapy, the right orchiectomy is otherwise well, and on exam, his left testicle is slightly smaller than normal at 16 cc's, but otherwise he has a, a normal post-orchiectomy exam. On his labs, the, one of the key things to determine is whether or not this patient has obstructive azospermia or non-obstructive azospermia. Semen analysis demonstrates azospermia times two, and you can see that he has a highly elevated FSH indicating a non-obstructive azospermia cause. He has normal testosterone and an elevated LH. So for him, in terms of his options, uh, the important options and discussion points that often come up are timing of sex after chemotherapy, how long should patients wait. For those patients who do indeed have sperm after chemotherapy, typically we advise waiting at least one year following chemotherapy. For some patients, there are questions about how toxic semen is itself, and there's no known reports of toxicity itself from the semen. For this patient, from a fertility standpoint, he really has three options. Microtessy, or microsurgical extraction of sperm and in vitro fertilization, donor sperm, and doing intrauterine insemination or adoption. The microtessy is a technique that's performed by reproductive urologists. It's done typically on the, the day of or day before egg retrieval, or it can be done as a frozen microtessy where tissue is, is cryopreserved in advance. This is done with a sedation or general anesthesia be with local anesthetic and a spermatic cord block. Typically the surgery takes at least two hours and looking for sperm can often take two to three hours and can in difficult cases take 16 or more hours of, of staff time. In looking at outcomes of microtessy in this setting, sperm retrieved in about 37 percent of patients overall. For patients who actually have some sperm either on previous biopsies or who ejaculate small numbers of sperm, the success rates are highest. Cyclophosphamide and other alkylating agents are, are associated with the worst chance of success. And overall, with patients who've undergone microtessy and have sperm, there's about a 50 percent clinical pregnancy rate and a 42 percent live birth rate. But what should our patient have done? So the appropriate approach for this patient would have been referral to a fertility specialist. And all major organizations' guidelines, including ASCO, ASRM, and AAP, all recommend referral to fertility specialists as long as well as the opportunity to bank sperm. If for patients who are unable to bank sperm, testicular sperm extraction is appropriate for these patients. For patients who have been able to bank sperm, they can either do intrauterine insemination if they have at least five to 10 million moving sperm on their frozen sample. And for patients with fewer sperm than this, in vitro fertilization is possible. The number of samples for a patient to bank should be maximized to allow patients to do as many IUI cycles or in vitro fertilization cycles as possible. Uh, many patients who have a diagnosis of cancer have samples that thaw more poorly non-cancer samples. Typically, about 50% of living viable sperm will be viable on thaw, but for some cancer patients that, that survival rate can be as low as 10% or sometimes poorer. Patients should be referred immediately to a fertility specialist as it can take significant amounts of time to bank as many sperm samples as possible. If the patient can't produce a sample, then testicular sperm extraction is usually the next best step.
Shifting gears to a young patient, so for prepubertal patients, the situation is quite different. In this, this particular patient uh, was a three-year-old with a brain tumor, and after undergoing surgery, he's been recommended to take a uh, series of chemotherapies, including vincristine, methotrexate, etoposide, cytoxan, and cisplatinant, all highly toxic to spermatogenesis. Patient's stable, and plan is to start chemotherapy next week. The plan for his chemotherapy is to get a central line placed a week from his initial visit as well as to get a lumbar puncture. And his parents ask you about the risk of fertility associated with the planned therapy and they ask you whether or not there's anything that can be done to help him. And what do you tell them? Well, the treatment effects on fertility uh, range from a zero sperm count or azospermia, oligospermia, or poor quality of sperm or functional infertility from some newer uh, targeted agents, or the inability to ejaculate for patients who've undergone pelvic or spine surgery, and for patients particularly who've had a radiation or a brain tumor or a radiation directly to the testicle, hypogonadism is a possibility. Many lower risk therapies like vincristine, methotrexate, ditanomycin can allow normal sperm production, but it can take an extended period of time. Higher risk therapies include ABVD, cisplatin, and BEP. Highest risk therapies are those such as melphalan, cyclophosphamide that have a very high risk of permanent sterility. It's important to note, however, that there is no no-risk chemotherapy. All patients exposed to any form of chemotherapy have, have some degree of risk of subfertility or permanent sterility. Targeted cancer therapies are poorly studied but are new therapies that should be investigated for their potential reproductive effects. In the case of therapies like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these have the potential to affect sperm functional properties like capacitation and hypermotility as well as the acrosome reaction. They also may affect basic properties of sperm production. Very little data is available on these and many other targeted therapies. Radiation therapy can be highly toxic to sperm production and the location of the radiation as well as the dose is highly important and predictive of sterility. Azospermia is often permanent if the testicles receive more than a three grade dose. In terms of endocrine function, the Leydig cells will respond with hypogonadism if greater than 30 gray for postpubertal patients and greater than 20 gray for prepubertal patients. So you decide to perform an open testicular biopsy for this patient at the same time they underwent a lumbar puncture or central line placement. But what can you do with this tissue? In a similar case, the mother of a 13-year-old transgender girl calls you about fertility preservation for her daughter. Since age 9, this young child has been taking Lupron and is considering switching to estradiol and spironolactone. On exam, the child is Tanner stage 2 with 4 milliliter testicles bilaterally. And the questions that are asked for you is how do these medications affect male infertility? What fertility preservation options are available for both pre- and post-pubertal transgender patients who are receiving therapy? So for transgender adolescents and young adults, typically estradiol and spironolactone are used in the United States to suppress the feelings of gender dysphoria. And for peripubertal children, Lupron is, is very common. And questions from family members arise around whether it's possible to bank sperm for postpubertal patients who are on hormone suppression, and what about peripubertal or prepubertal transgender youth? So it's important to think about the effects of Lupron. Lupron affects the GnRH pituitary gonadal axis by ultimately decreasing FSH and LH and leading to a complete shutdown in testosterone production as well as sperm production. Spironolactone, on the other hand, affects testosterone biosynthesis and is, does not always completely shut down this axis. It is possible to successfully bank sperm while on spironolactone and estrogen and it's been demonstrated that a significantly lower semen volume is found for patients on these therapies, a lower sperm concentration, lower sperm motility. However, it is possible to get viable modal sperm. For patients on Lupron, it, typically there's no sperm. And for a prepubertal patient, these cells within the testicle are not yet developing into sperm. For all prepubertal patients, in the future, it may be possible to do one of two things. It may be possible to grow sperm from sperm stem cells and then do in vitro fertilization and intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Or fertility restoration may be possible by performing a testicular biopsy followed by a testicular cell transplant and conceive naturally. The testicular biopsy itself takes about 30 minutes. 
requires a small testicular biopsy. And important to note, again, that sperm stem cells are found, but no sperm is found in prepubertal males and in transgender females. The two of several potential options include autologous spermatogonial stem cell transplantation. This technique has been successful in many species and was uh, first demonstrated in rats in 1994 and most recently in monkeys. And this potentially could allow natural conception or in vitro fertilization or with ICSI. In contrast, a second option would be to perform in vitro maturation of sperm stem cells. One would start with a small amount of source material, the, the testis biopsy, and grow sperm. This particular technique has been successful in, in mice, but has never been done in, in other mammals. To summarize, it's very important that collaboration exists between different services, including social workers, oncologists, nursing, cryopreservation laboratories, and urology, and early referral is very important. Sperm or tissue banking should ideally be performed prior to fertility threatening therapy. Experimental testicular biopsy fertility preservation can be offered under IRB protections for prepubertal boys and transgender females. And care providers should form individualized plans based on each clinical situation and work together to achieve solutions to all of these challenges.